When I approach concept art and illustration, I usually do so with the motive of staying within the bounds of practical realism and historical functionality. However, despite my appreciation for the concept of form following function in visual design, some of my favorite illustrations have little adherence to this rule altogether. If you look at the margins of a medieval manuscript, the open seas part of an old map, or the diagrams in an ancient scientific text, you will see a variety of creatures, half-beasts, and impossible monsters with often comical levels of biological inaccuracy. If my preference leads towards practical realism, why is it that I get so much joy in looking at these false depictions of myths and misrepresented animals? I think there is something particularly alluring about using a reference that has little visual basis in reality, and using it as a jumping off point to explore the more often overlooked crossroads of where fact meets fiction. Ancient and medieval accounts and manuscripts showcase a variety of the common mythological creatures we've come to know and love in the modern day. Not only are these creatures depicted, but they are often presented in a way that conveys many of the moral and philosophical themes associated with them. So I thought, as an experiment, it could be fun to look into the older descriptions of these beasts and see if I can use biological realism to design a version of the animal that conforms to our modern understanding of physiology. I think a unicorn would be a good subject to start with, because it closely resembles a real animal and it also has a ton of common tropes associated with it. So, let's look at some of the ways people have described these creatures throughout history and see if we can create a design that is a bit more plausible than the fabrications of the past. While many civilizations have depictions of creatures that could be referred to as unicorns due to having a single horn, such as a bull-shaped creature from the Indus Valley Civilization, as well as the chimera-like Kilin from China, these creatures don't seem to have any meaningful connection to the Greek origin which later evolved into the classic depictions we know from medieval Europe. For this reason, I'm going to focus on the Western depictions more exclusively as a base inspiration for my design. The earliest references to unicorns from the Greeks are intended as natural observations and aren't understood as myths in the same way that creatures like the satyrs or gorgons are. The ancient Greeks, as well as the later Europeans inspired by them, seem to believe that these creatures actually existed. Many of you may already know that Norwal horns discovered on beaches were mistaken for unicorn horns and were believed to be proof of their existence, but other sightings influence this belief as well. The Greek physician and historian Titius wrote a description of a unicorn in his book Indica, which includes many secondhand accounts he heard while staying on the Indian subcontinent. He describes them as having a horn over a cubit long, having white, black, and red coloring, as well as several other descriptors that would indicate to me that he was mistakenly referring to something similar to an oryx or antelope. This account also lays much of the groundwork for the idea that unicorn horns are a quote, antidote to poisonous drugs, the idea that unicorn horns contain healing properties. This idea even led to the creation of drinking cups made from unicorn horns. A few of these cups still exist, although they were obviously made of the horns of some other animal, masquerading as the real thing. It was believed that drinking from these cups would prevent poisoning and perhaps provide other medicinal benefits. Medieval Europeans likely had many differing views on the reality of unicorns depending on who you asked. However, there are a few prevailing myths commonly described in this era of history. The common medieval understanding was that unicorns were fierce and untamable, and that they resembled small goats, horses, or donkeys. It was said that unicorns could not be caught or hunted unless a virgin maiden would sit calmly in waiting until the unicorn approached and placed its head in her lap of its own volition. Hunters could then descend upon the creature while calmed by the girl. This idea of an animal stricken down despite being in a calm and peaceful state gave the unicorn a connection to Christ. It was often used as a symbol for Christ's innocence and connection to virgin birth. While I don't want my take on the unicorn to be a direct copy of one specific interpretation, I really like the idea of designing a creature that represents a dichotomy between fierce and pleasant. If treated as a threat, it will respond in kind by darting, bolting, and tramping. If treated with tenderness, however, it will respond with a docile temperament, allowing its pleasant beauty to be truly appreciated. Well, I'm starting to get a good sense of the direction I want to take this design, so let's look into some of the real-world animals inspiring the unicorn to help understand its underlying anatomy. There is an account from Pliny the Elder that has influenced European tales of the unicorn, which mentions an animal with a single black horn, the head of a stag, the feet of an elephant, and the tail of a boar. This account is most likely referring to a rhinoceros. 
While it could be interesting to reimagine a unicorn with a more rhino-like appearance, I think this type of physiology strays too far from the thematic interpretation I'm going for. The obvious answer would be to start with the horse as the basis for the anatomy, but most of the stories of riding unicorns seem to be modern. That and the equine family of horses don't have any horns. I think going in a more bovine direction would be more appropriate. Animals such as domesticated cattle, goats, and antelope are part of the bovidae family. Bovidae are separate from deer in that their horns grow a type of sheath from protruding bones on the skull, and unlike deer, these do not shed. If a unicorn were to exist as a part of an evolutionary line connected to other species, the bovidae family seems to be the most anatomically appropriate. This also provides a great amount of visual reference to work from. Bovidae have a great variety of coat types and colors, horns of all shapes and sizes, and even variation in the shape and size of the body and head. So now I need to decide on some shapes and colors that get across the idea of an animal that people would naturally associate with the concepts of healing, peace, fields of maidens, etc., while maintaining a basic plausibility in the creature's anatomy. I want to design the skeletal structure in its entirety, but first I want to play around by drawing a series of full creature profiles so I can determine what gives the best aesthetic. I ended up settling on something of moderate size, less bulky and hunched than an oryx, while still larger and sleeker than a goat domesticated for wool. I want the final painting to have some degree of shaggier hair to give a look that suggests softness while also giving a wild unkemptness to its fur. Some of the parts of the body will have smoother hair to better show off potential stripes and patterns in their coloring. The Metropolitan Museum of Art has a series of tapestries that contain unicorns from the late Gothic period. One of the tapestries depicts a unicorn tamed and at peace, fenced under a pomegranate tree. Red stains are depicted on the unicorn's body that, debatably, represent either the blood from the wounds sustained in its hunt and capture, or more likely the droplets from the fruit's juices dripping down from above. I really like the idea that red markings on the animal's flanks could be given speculative meaning by anyone who witnessed the creature in the wild. Both motifs, blood, as well as fruit associated with fertility, reinforce the idea that the unicorn could represent resistance to force, as well as acceptance of tenderness, like in the stories with the hunters and the maiden. Well, next up, I guess we need to address the elephant-footed monosaurus in the room and talk about how I intend to design the horn. The classic style of unicorn horn based off the Norwal is an off-white, straight spiral that comes to a very narrow point. I want to keep some of the style of this horn, but tweak it in a way that is more evolutionarily feasible. A bovine skull could potentially produce a single horn if some sort of genetic mutation became prevalent. I'm no biologist, but I had the idea that maybe a unicorn could actually have two horns on the skull, but that the sheath that extends off those points could sort of fuse and grow out as one solid chunk, giving the outward appearance of a single horn. Maybe one horn would grow in front as a sort of shorter knob, while the other would grow behind into a longer protrusion. Or the fusing would just naturally lead to a shape that resembled one long horn from the outside. I know the classic look has the horn growing forward out of the forehead, but I kind of like the idea of it growing back and upward before curving slightly forward at the tip. This helps convey visually the idea that the creature doesn't portray obvious aggression, but that it is still willing to tilt its head at aggressors if provoked. Regarding the whole healing properties thing, I don't want my design to contain any actual magical properties. The only scientific connection I was able to make was that keratin, which makes up the structure of bovine horns, is insoluble in water and weak acids, according to a quick Google search. If a unicorn horn had a higher concentration of keratin than other animals, it might show some interesting reactions in a powdered form, which could cause people to falsely believe that it had properties that could repel corruption in liquids or something. I don't know, just a thought. So, now that I've planned out the unicorn's overall anatomy, all I have left to do is paint it. I want to include some other details in the composition, such as a depiction of a goblet crafted from the horn, and some details that provide some clues as to the philosophical concepts attributed to the creature. I'll need to plan a few compositions and color studies to get a basic idea of the final image. This will allow me to make my mistakes and revisions in this stage, so I will know exactly what to do for the final painting. I really like the style of old botanical illustrations, seeing how people of the past tried to record natural history. I'd like to emulate the style of these as well as some of the motifs of the medieval manuscripts of the past. I think I want to portray a pose that gives a full side view of the anatomy while keeping the head bowed down as if grazing. This will make the horn point forward even though the animal is in a state of calm, emphasizing the dichotomy I mentioned earlier. Designing a mythological creature in a plausible way shouldn't only focus on pure scientific realism. 
It is still a fictional beast at the end of the day, and if I want to make a design that conveys the mythical status of a unicorn, I don't want to jeopardize the motifs associated with it. I want it to look like an animal that would inspire ideas of innocence, beauty, and the reverence of untarnished youth, while also giving off the vibe that it's still a real animal that will become temperamental when disturbed, living as a part of a real environment. There is no sense in designing something that exists as a part of a mythological lineage that humanity has used as an allegory for specific ideas if none of those ideas remain present when viewing the work. The challenge is maintaining both, seeing if we can comfortably meld together the beauty of natural observation with the themes that inspire us to come up with fabrication and myth. I hope you've enjoyed what you've seen here today. If you have any knowledge about unicorns that I've missed in this video, I would love to hear about it in the comments below. Stay tuned for more mythological creature designs in the future. Thank you for watching.